Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, a show that will help you transform your marketing from mere messaging to programs that break the rules and make a difference. Join the movement today and learn non-traditional techniques that give you an edge. Now, here's your chief marketing renegade, Drew Neiser. Let's all agree for a moment that awareness matters if you're trying to sell your product or service. Buying something you've never heard of comes with inherent risk, huge risk, and risk that is immediately removed by familiarity. If you've heard of it, you probably feel a little more comfortable with it. So the dream then for marketers would be universal awareness such that everyone who might want to buy your product is aware of it. We could also conclude that brands that achieve noun status like Band-Aid or Kleenex or Chapstick and Scotch Tape, um, by the way, there's a word for that. It's called an eponym. And there's a great article that I'll link to in the blog notes on mental floss where they list about 40 brands that have become uh, nouns. But anyway, I'm digressing. So these brands are so cemented in our brains that they enjoy unbelievable um, brand loyalty and sort of a competitive advantage. I mean, you don't think of lip gloss, you think of chapstick, you don't think of tissue, you think of Kleenex. And so that for the most part, is really true. Although, by the way, there you probably didn't know that Formica and Styrofoam were nouns that were brand names, right? And, and so, and those I don't think necessarily have competitive advantages anymore. Anyway, now the lawyers listening would say, no, Drew, that's the wrong language. When a brand becomes used as a generic, they risk their trademark. True enough, but I don't know a young brand that wouldn't gladly welcome the challenge of dealing with universal awareness. Okay. So now in my mind, there's an even higher form of brand recognition, and that's when your brand becomes a verb, like FedExing or Googling or rollerblading, that describes the action or role of the category. And I have certainly worked with a few clients that dreamed of becoming a verb, a true sign you are the leader in your marketplace. My kids use Venmo as a verb, as in, hey, dad, just Venmo me the money, okay? And, uh, And another brand that achieve both noun and verb status is Xerox. When I started out in the ad business in the traffic department at Wells Rich Green three decades ago, my boss would say, hey, Drew, go make a Xerox of this. And I could spend a good part of my day Xeroxing stuff. But a lot has changed in the last three decades, especially in the use of office machines and the way work flows around the office, which leads to the question of the day. What would you do if suddenly you were in charge of Xerox marketing? How would you change or at least evolve perceptions? How would you capitalize on your strong heritage while speaking to a new generation of workers? Well, fortunately for you, our guest today is Tony Clayton Hine, Senior Vice President and CMO of that venerable company we just mentioned, Xerox. Among other things, Tony is here today to tell us how Xerox has embraced uh, the trend of connectivity and connectedness and courageously explored new idea, new ideas to stay relevant in the workplace of the 21st century and presumably beyond. And with that long, exhausting intro, welcome to the show, Tony. Thank you so much. Thrilled, thrilled to be here. <laughs> so let's start with the sort of the big, the big question, uh, and the big challenge. I mean, what does it mean, uh, to have this universal awareness. Everybody knows Xerox, right? Absolutely. It's a double-edged sword, as you mentioned, right? So for having 110 years of history behind us, the one thing that we can say as our brand is that we innovate the way the world communicates, connects, and works. And so while that used to mean making a photocopy, um, that's really changed significantly in terms of how the world works today. So a lot more focus on communicating and connecting and doing that in both a physical and a digital way. So my challenge is not to make you aware of Xerox, as you mentioned, but make you aware of what Xerox stands for today and how we help companies at this intersection of physical and digital. Okay. So that's, there, there was a lot in there and, and I, I'm not a fan of this term, but I think we need to do it. I think we need to unpack some of that. Right. <laughs> so let's talk about, uh, this, this connecting and the communicating and what are we, uh, let's, so I, I want to break it down. I want to start with the strategy 
of your campaign. So the strategy is you know about Xerox, but you don't know this. Mm -hmm. So we have to educate Context. Yes. Right. We spend a lot of time talking about what is Xerox in the context of the modern workplace. Okay. So, and what is Xerox in the context of the modern workplace? It is this idea of helping people communicate and work at that intersection of physical and digital. Okay. So, um, you have a, a, a relatively new campaign. Yes, we yeah. do, as a matter of fact. Well, let's talk about that. Oh, that would be great. Uh, it is called Project Set the Page Free. And um, it gave us this incredible opportunity to frame how Xerox solves these problems today, uh, leveraging the creative work of 14 really famous, magnificent authors, writers, and contributors. Okay, so let me stop you there. Uh, set the Page Free. Why that language? Why is it, why are we setting the page free? So we worked a lot with what is the current perception of Xerox? You think of us in that physical element, right? Putting marks on paper, which are pages. But when we think about what is a page today, it's both the physical and the digital form. And where do we spend most of our time and energy is actually setting that free to do something with it. So whether or not you photocopy something today is much less important to me than if you're moving information from one place to another. And then how can we contribute that so that we can help you communicate better and be more productive and effective? Okay. So we have this idea. We're, we're going to set the page free and we have these authors. And so what happens? What, what's this content with the authors look like? So we asked, uh, we worked with uh, the 92nd Street Y. So they were our key in to help because they had the relationship with these authors. So our uh, ad agency, YNR, came up with this idea and said, what if we were able to create this partnership with the Y and leverage their relationships and have all of these different authors contribute on their perspectives on the modern workplace? Sounded pretty interesting. Um, but what was most interesting to me is not just the words that they wrote, but how they would be able to leverage Xerox technology to help this project come to life. Okay, that's cool. So it's not, a, and this is important because it, it's sort of the message uh, and the medium sort of come together. It's not just, because you could get these authors to just write beautiful things right. that may or may, may not sort of involve in any way your product. So right, bringing the product into this is an important part of it. All right. So we have these 12 authors and what, what are we seeing? What are we from these folks? So we literally asked them with no boundaries to contribute their perspectives on the modern workplace. So when Lee Child, who writes the Jack Reacher series, contributes his chapter, it has some element of suspense, which he's known for. Amy Mann and Jonathan Coulter, as singer-songwriters, actually contribute a song. And when Roxanne Gay talks about what is the workplace look like or Joyce Carol Oates talks about her perspective written in a fiction work about being a professor, you start to get these different elements of what they consider work. And what we quickly see is work is definitely not a place anymore. So all of these guys come together contributing their chapters. The 92nd Street Y through Bernard puts together as the editor and threads all these pieces and then Sloane Crosley, who is a New York Times bestselling essayist, actually creates the connective tissue between these works to help formulate a book. Okay, so um, I started reading the book today. And by the way, uh, for those of you listening, I'm going to link to a lot of this content. I've watched some of the videos. Uh, I, um, I love the one with Lee Child and the whole suspense thing. And I've you know read several of the Reacher books, so particularly a fan. Um, so I will put all those in there. And I started to read the book and it's beautifully written. I mean, it's just, and as someone who writes and, you know, th there's writing and then there's writing, this is beautiful writing. But I, and, and I, so let's just stop there. I mean, it must be fun to just have content that is so extraordinary. Well, you certainly start to realize these people are the best at their craft when you see their output. You know, they can take one chapter on their perspective and it's so 
are beautifully articulated and great imagery, and you just realize that they're at the top of their game for a reason, right? It's no accident that a New York Times bestselling author is that well known and important. Uh, it's it's true, and in, in fact, uh, uh, regular listeners of, to the show will have heard two episodes with Chris Bajalian, who um, is a uh, just a, a amazing writer and a wonderful human being, and we had a lot of fun talking about that. But uh, as I talked about early in the in that show, uh, his success was not a surprise to anybody who knew him because uh, one of his work ethic and two is just raw talent, and so it, and it takes that combination. You can see it come through right away. And so what was interesting as we went through the creative process is that we would see the chapters come in and I would think, how on earth are these going to thread together? So probably the most impressed for, for me impress was Sloan's work to be able to thread it with, um, creating chapters to make a more holistic view. And I thought, how is this going to happen? And when it did, he said, oh, okay. Uh, so she was able to lend her view on that, which made it really engaging throughout, as opposed to just a compilation or a collection that had no connection at all. Yeah, no, I think that was a really smart uh, thing. And, and I encourage you all to read it and you will uh, see a, da- a you, I'll link to even my download. Anyway, uh, we're going to take a quick break. Um, and, uh, this is a good moment for me to remind you all that, uh, we would love to have you as a subscriber to Renegade Thinkers Unite. So you could put this episode on pause, go to your favorite channel, iTunes podcast, uh, wherever you want, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and subscribe. Uh, that would be awesome. We don't want you to miss, uh, any episodes, uh, as they come out. Okay. We'll be right back. Hey, it's Drew. I wanted to use this break to ask you a single question. Are you a courageous marketer? Do you have the courage to go to your board of directors and say marketing could drive the growth of this company? We just need three times the budget. Do you have the courage to take the big idea that you already have and extend it internally and externally through influencers, through the media, through all of your content? If you're a courageous marketer but aren't sure how to roadmap all of this, I have a big idea for you. It's called Renegade Thinking. It's a program that we've developed and work with exclusively for B2B marketers, generally at large companies. And I want to give you my cell phone, 917-679-8852. Just text Renegade Thinking to 917-679-8852. And we can talk about how you can cut through. Okay, we're back. And uh, my guest is Tony Clayton Hine, who is the CMO of Xerox. And we were talking about a program that they've uh, created called Set the Page Free. And one of the things, and this is incredible content. And I think a lot of brands create content, but very few create a, a content at this level. But once you've done that, you have to market the marketing. And, and as I was reading Set the Page Free, I was thinking, who's going to read this? Who's going to take the time? I mean, they will be so rewarded if they do, but will anybody take the time to do it? So we were thrilled to see that we've had um, tens of thousands of downloads and engagement with both the site Set the Page Free, which gives the backstory, as well as the book itself. Um, and what we've seen from people that are downloading it, it is uh, both business decision makers. It is also both IT decision makers, which are really important to our target audience. So we're seeing both both of those. And um, the goal of the book is to help people be entertained. And then from a marketing standpoint is to help people see how this book came to life. And that's really what the marketing of the book has been around, which is what were the different pieces of Xerox technology that helped make this a reality? Okay. So um, you talked about the interesting that uh, – so the good news is you've gotten a lot of downloads. I'm imagining that you had to invest a fair amount of dollars to get those, right? Because you had to get people to – become aware of the book. They had to be uh, interested enough to give the name, to get it, to download it, and then and then to read it. So how did you market the marketing, if you will? 
So was really the opportunity to leverage the celebrity of the different authors, and that really helped engage um, the audience as well as amplify our reach. So quite frankly, helped our dollars go farther. So when Lee Childs retweets or Gary Steingart or the 92nd Street Y, um, we also did this in conjunction with World Reader, um, which is a nonprofit organization focused on global literacy. They helped us amplify the message as well. So being able to tell that story in terms of how it came to life, uh, leverage the social footprint of all of these authors around the project really helped our dollars go farther. And then also gave us a lot of PR amplification simply because it was, as we had hoped, an interesting story. And that allowed us to get picked up by the New York Times business section or Entertainment Weekly on their blogs. Uh, so it helps us thread both of those together. Right. And so you have the, the advantage of you're doing a program that is unusual. I mean, gathering 12 sort of big names like this is just the sheer, um, it's a, it's a big effort. Um, when, uh, and you have to, it's a big commitment up front. And it's not one where you could necessarily know it was going to work or not. So how did you have the courage to say to your, uh, CEO that, Hey, we got this kind of, it's a big idea and it's not testable, <laughs> right? Cause you, if you just yeah. did it with one author, it would have been just one author and then it wouldn't have really worked. You had to go out big to make this work. So we really did um, take a moonshot, as it were, to be able to make this work. And that was because for me as a new CMO for Xerox with a company that you know that wants to reshape how you think about us, we had to take a risk. And one of the things that I personally look at is in the B2B space, I'm constantly looking at what works in B2C. And then what can we borrow or steal or copy from the B2C environment that we think could work? And then how do we then be able to tell that story? So we have an incredibly supportive CEO who understood that we needed to be able to tell this story about what we stood for today in a unique and compelling way. And then there was a relative leap of faith in terms of understanding this is what we're thinking. This is how we think it's going to manifest itself in terms of brand awareness and consideration and even down to demand generation. And so um, you're going to go for it because this is – potentially going to be great. <laughs> well, it's interesting. And the way you put that is, is, is fascinating because you had no choice. You had to take a risk. And because in some ways, people think they know who you are. Right. And so you need to be disruptive. But I would argue that all brands need to be disruptive because um, otherwise you're just ignored. You know, we have, uh, our logo is a saw here for a reason. If you don't cut through, what was the point? So it's interesting that you were, you felt compelled and that made it easier to rationalize and the CEO was able to rationalize. And oh, by the way, you were also presenting this very classy, very, you know, it wasn't like you were, you know, it, it, frankly, it wasn't as big a risk as, say, the monks were years and years ago, which is sort of, you know, way out there, right? right? I mean, that's a way out there idea. And, and it was just a funny a moment in time for Xerox. But this, you know, 12 sort of creative people. All right. Also, I, in, in, in sort of talking about this, you started to use the term story and storytelling. Um, let's talk about that. Is, what does that mean to you? So I'm a big believer in storytelling and the fact that we have to always show the outcome, not the input. So you're very familiar with Xerox in terms of what it does, but I want to focus the story on what the outcome will be once you have had that experience. And I don't think that's unique to Xerox. I think that's unique. That's something that everybody has to do. So finding the story and then being able to use your technology, your product, your service to help show how that comes to life is a pretty natural thing for me. Um, and again, what you're starting to look through is not the story, but which of the stories and what's the angle that's going to be the most compelling to that audience. And uh, so a couple of things uh, on this show way earlier, um, we talked about uh, with Chandar of, of Marketo, who's now at Koopa. And we talked about uh, his phrase was people don't want candles, they want light. Uh, you know, I, I always say they don't want 
uh, shovels they want to hold. So you, that's what you're talking about with outcome. Absolutely. Right. And so you're presenting a different kind of outcome than they're used to perceiving with, with Xerox. Um, when we talk about story now, um, do you think there's an overall story that you're telling that these, uh, each of these things are essentially chapters of the story? So we look at it more as how the different pieces of the technology that are used, I would say that I'm more focused on. And simply because we are a B2B technology company, my goal is to make sure that we're seen as fresh and relevant and that we have an understanding of our different audiences. So in my space, we have a buyer who's actually different from our user. And they care about different things. So our buyer is usually the IT guy or the CFO um, who's looking at the technology itself. But where I think that we can win and where if I look back 110 years ago, where Xerox One was actually talking to the user, the person who was interacting with our devices or our technology to be able to create this outcome. So I don't know if that, I mean, it's probably somewhat unique to us, but we had lost that a little bit. When we, um, we used to be a, a bigger company, we had acquired a business process outsourcing company called ACS, which then became part of Xerox. And then at the beginning of this year, spun off to become a separate company. All that messaging for those 10 years had been very buyer focused, CFO, CIO kind of focused. And we kind of lost this element of what made us successful to begin with was this user. So that was for me the story I wanted to tell, which was as a person who's using the technology, can I, can I interrupt your thinking enough to say, Oh yes, there is a different way that I could work in order to create this outcome that's better for me. So it's sort of B to B to C in some ways. Absolutely. And uh, it just reminds me, I mean, years ago when we launched Panasonic Tough Book, sure it was a ruggedized computer and we were selling B to B and, you know, we could quantify the amount of damage that would happen, you know, business loss because of de notebook deaths. But what resonated was the personal loss when your computer dies. Right. Oh my God. You know, so, uh, getting those people at the very end of it who were using these things to say, you know, I don't want a computer that will die when I'm out in the field. Anyway. We're going to take another break. We're going to dive into how do these pieces fit together and how the heck do you measure them? So stay tuned. Hey, it's Drew. I was at a conference the other day and somebody looked at my saw lapel pen and said, what's up with that? And I said, well, what's the one thing that marketing has always had to do? Forget digital, forget all this stuff. What is the one marketing imperative? And uh, he looked at me and went, cut through. And I went, yes, ding, 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 ding. That's right. Cut through through. That is what marketing must do. And it's not just cutting through the clutter, although that's really important because if your marketing doesn't th cut through the clutter, it's like the proverbial tree in the forest that falls and nobody hears it. But it's also cutting through the crap and the processes that inhibit innovation. We've been working a lot lately with some CMOs to help them cut through the crap and get at the essence of what is their big idea. And how can they make a case to expand that idea across their business? That, to me, is cutting through. Okay, we're back. And my guest is Tony Clayton Hine, who is the CMO of Xerox. And we've been talking about the big picture story um, and how these pieces sort of fit together. And now I want to bring it down to, okay, we have this big story, but I also noticed that in addition to these authors and these uh, these videos that you did with them, there are lots of other uh, things that you've created that sort of make this idea, uh, bring it to life in a way that a, a business could understand it and see a different kind of Xerox. Uh, that That's really our goal, right? Which is to make sure we show how Xerox can help bring this to life in the hopes that you'll think that you may be able to apply some of this thinking technology ideas back in your own office. So we see this as the beginning of a broader platform for us where we're able to show how we help people set the page free, which means how is that business more productive? How is that company more agile and competitive? And then we'll start to talk, move from the idea of perspectives on the modern workplace into 
your modern workplace so that as this campaign continues to evolve, uh, we can get a bit more personal at a business level. Okay. So how do we measure? We've got this big idea. We have this big sort of content program up here on a high level that's about changing perceptions. And then we have this next level down, which is about making it tangible. Set the page free is this big idea and it's a little esoteric, right? But it's very cool and it's disruptive. And then you have some, another layer. How do you measure? And when you report back on this uh, campaign, how do you sort of get these pieces to sort of fit together and, and say, wow, this is really working? So one of the decisions we made was to make it a hundred percent digital. So decide purposefully that we wanted to create some sort of digital signature with every asset that we created and that we wanted to take people on a journey um, that we could extend far beyond the book. So being able to create assets that we could drip out. First, we started with a teaser, this is coming. Then we started to talk about, here's some of the authors. Then we helped people or drove people to the website so they could sign up to get updates. Now that we've launched the book, we are... Uh, uh, using those contacts to say, come back. And then, so I wanted to make sure that we had this digital footprint so that ultimately far down the line that I can use that for demand generation. And then with the data that we collect across the journey, that that helps us determine who's engaging, what types of businesses are they in, what types of departments are they in, in businesses, why are they engaging, where are they going along their own, you know, self-directed journey. And that will help us inform the content, what's resonating, where could we amplify, where does things like social complement the traditional search and digital platforms. So that was really important to us. Okay. So one thing you do when you do 100% digital is you give up reach Mm -hmm. because it's just impossible to get the kind of reach that you could get in in other other channels. Uh, Google would argue differently, but (laughs) for the most part, it's true. So how do you make sure that you are getting that reach? I mean, it, PR isn't all just digital, or were you only caring about the what was showing up in the in basically online? No, I mean, for, for us, it was it was understanding and being dogged about who our target market really is. And so, you know, Xerox is not a personal brand. It, it's a B2B brand. Um, you generally are looking at a, a larger or more technologically sophisticated company. So the mom and pop shop is probably not our target audience, right? You, there's better, more cost effective, lower feature uh, products for them, right? So that helps us define who really is that target audience. And then as you go in that B2B environment, you break those out into buyers and users, and then you start to create some of that. And you think, you start to realize, I don't need to reach millions and millions of millions of people. I just need to reach the right audience in a repetitive fashion. Okay. So, uh, we're narrowing it down. Uh, Byron Sharp fans, uh, We'll, we'll, might take issue with this, but we're gonna, we're gonna focus and say there's a certain number of people who can buy this product and we're gonna make sure we're in front of those and we're gonna give them a frequency of eight at least, right. if not more. Uh, and then, uh, so, okay. So what were the key metrics for you? And I could argue that you didn't necessarily need to do set the page free with all those guys to do, get the, at least, in front of those people, right. you needed that to disrupt and have them change perceptions about this. So in your sort of methodology for measurement, are you measuring uh, perception change? So our measurement just takes a look across the buyer's journey, right? So we did the brand study that asked, you know, what was your likelihood to buy? Did it increase? Did it cause brand lift uh, across the board from quality, trustworthiness, willingness to consider. Um, and we've seen some really nice uptick in that, which is just general awareness, perception, consideration. Are you tracking quarterly, monthly? Right now, I mean, we're about 100 days into the campaign. Mm-hmm. So we just did a touch point in, and f- for that type of activity. Um, then we're also measuring everything that I could capture from the digital signature, how many people signed up for the program 
along the way? How many people downloaded the book? Um, how many, how do those people then drive into a further nurture campaign so I could start to introduce the idea of, um, this is how the technology came to life. This is how it would have, could play out in your company, right? So I've got a very long tail that we are setting up right now in terms of engaging people along that. But right now it's being able to say, uh, against our target audience, how many people are engaging, how many people are filling out forms, downloading books, you know, getting into my Marketo system, as it were, um, to be able to nurture them downstream. Right. So we're just talking, so we get these numbers and we market the heck out of them and through an automated drip process and eventually they convert into a new, uh, into a customer. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it occurs to me that, first of all, that most of the businesses that you're targeting have some equipment already. So, you know, the, they're, they're either in a replacement mode or they're a new company that suddenly grew and need, has new needs. So one of the things that I think is interesting about what you're doing is you're showing new ways to think about how to use your product. You're actually trying to grow the market, if you will, by increasing the usage opportunities of the product itself. Absolutely. So um, I use uh, in this example, and I hope it's okay on the show, which is I don't want to be BlackBerry in an Apple world, right? So in a, in a B2B technology company, I, I could either talk about the feature functions of the devices itself and how my device is better than their device and my solution is better than their solution at a very technological head-to-head -head way. Or I could create this push and pull where I said the user with Apple and all the apps are the ones that brought Apple into the workplace because they said, here's some different ways that you can use a similar type device to be able to accomplish a different goal. So being able to show we have all of these apps that actually connect your physical and your digital, and you can translate and you can go do things in a mobile fashion and you can connect to Dropbox and you can do all of these activities. So I want people to know that there's more than you can do than just fax and print and scan, but then also be able to see themselves like, that could be interesting to take a look at it. So the more you use and interact with all the features and functions and opportunities we have, the stickier you are, the more likely you'll say, if I do have a replacement opportunity, this is one, or I didn't know I could use this for that. Okay. So we're, we're coming to the end of the episode, right? And I'm about to do my big wrap up. Um, but uh, tell me what you think sort of the biggest lesson learned so far in this, uh, if you were sort of starting again, what would any, any, anything that you would tweak? Probably the ability to control it a little more. I mean, there was a lot of open variables. When you say we're working with the 92nd Street Y, who's going to engage with some subset of great authors and contributors, that was very much a leap of faith. So I probably would have locked that down a little bit more. Um, the ability to really be more directive about um, how we were able, we're going to show bringing the technology to life. Um, we probably would have locked that down more. Um, we had such an incredible group of people on this project that helped do that, but there was for the team so much angst in terms of the unknown. And so we got what we, we, we got exactly what we wanted out of the end, but I felt like it would have been better to take away some of that variability for them because that just caused unnecessary stress. That's fun. You know, and that's, that's a wonderful story. And I, and I want to, I'm going to emphasize that because if you were doing a bold, courageous program, chances are you as an organization are going to be facing exactly what Tony was talking about. You are going to be making a leap of faith and you are going to be handing over if you will, some conversations that your brand is going to be sharing that you're not in control of. And it's going to make you very nervous and you're going to wish you could control it more. But the outcome, the more you control it, the less the outcome will be sort of, uh, I won't say relevant is the wrong word, it, original and real. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so you made that choice. And, and I think if you had gone in and said, Hey, Lee Childs, here's what you need to talk about. Yeah. First of all, he would never do it. Right. Absolutely. Right. Okay. And, and, and second of all, you wouldn't have got something that was true. Right. 
and and real. And so I think that's really important. So I'm going to attempt to uh, talk about this program and what you marketers can take away. Uh, first, there was a big idea at the very beginning of it, this notion of set the page free. Um, is a big enough storyline that it can accommodate both this high-level story with uh, these very sophisticated writers and authors and musicians, and then you could bring it down to sort of a, a tighter product story. So I think that's, if you're looking for a storyline, um, if you started on the product level, I think you you might have a problem because you wouldn't be able to elevate it back. But if you start high and you can sort of work your way down, there was a lot of trust that went into this campaign. You trusted um, your partners. Now, and what I thought was interesting, and I and I was glad you said this, was when you bring on a well-known author, you also bring their media channels with them. Right. And so that helps. So that that's where some of the exposure of this will be. Um, there was also a lot of sort of multi-channel, multi-purpose. You had uh, events at the 90 Seconds 3Y. You had the video content with these folks. You had the book. And importantly, and I think this is a place where I've seen these kinds of efforts fail. And so you had this other editor who took these 12 pieces and st- put them together in a way that they actually work together. Uh, and that, uh, I think was it was a huge part of it. Finally, uh, how do you measure something like this? And, and I think, uh, was delighted to hear that there was a brand measure involved. We spent more time actually talking about the demand gen measures because ultimately that's how you're going to see business flow, you think. But I would argue that the brand perception change that happened here is just as likely to impact that final decision as that email that showed up in the email box. It's just that that email may be better timed and therefore get a higher level of attribution. But this notion that Xerox is something different than you think, uh, that little worm <laughs> is going to be very hard to measure. Um, and it's very hard to measure to be able to link that to a new purchase. Um, but you had no choice. Well, we tried to do the best we could, right? Saying, what have we learned across the board from all these different companies that do great brand work and then, you know, all the way through? And so uh, we, we wanted to take that leap in order to be able to accomplish that. So it's very cool. It's really been fun talking to you. I wonder if there is uh, uh, you, another sort of – if you were had a bunch of CMOs in front of you, one do and one don't as a result of uh, your experience uh, in this campaign. So one do would be take the idea – that's big and socialize it around your company. Um, take the opportunity to talk to the CEO about what the implications will be on the broad picture, but then what will this do for sales and how do the products get shown and what does HR going to benefit from it? So for me, that really helped sell something that was a bit intangible, intangible for them to see. Uh, so that would be my do. And, uh, my don't would be, um, making sure that you d- don't lock everything down, as you said, which was, you know, don't, don't try to control so much of the process that it's not true and that it doesn't look authentic. Um, and, uh, there were points in there where we had to make decisions on whether we drove to set the page free or whether we drove to Xerox and how much we were in the forefront or in the background. Um, and, uh, don't, Get so focused on putting your product in the background that you lose the authenticity of the program. Interesting. That's really – that's a great don't. So, all right. With that, uh, we're going to wrap up the uh, this episode of uh, Renegade Thinkers Unite. Tony, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been great. And so – and to the Renegade listeners out there, too, a, a second appeal, a do for you – subscribe and write a review. would love to have a review on a couple channels that I don't have as many reviews. Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio. We're, we're really in good shape on iTunes. Anyway, um, until next time, uh, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. This has been Renegade Thinkers Unite, but it doesn't end there. Just go to RenegadeThinkersUnite.com for more and subscribe to the show. That way, you'll never miss an episode. We'll talk with you next time on Renegade Thinkers Unite.